Well, good morning, church. How are we doing? We good? Hey, uh, a couple weeks ago, I started getting this, uh, this nagging toothache up here uh, in, in my, in my uh, tooth back here in a molar. And so I didn't think anything of it. Usually that happens when I get some kind of sinus issue. So I had some sinus issues. And yet this toothache just kind of wouldn't go away, just couldn't shake it, wouldn't ease up. And so after doing what, what all males do and just fighting it until I couldn't fight it anymore, I just decided I got to call. I got to do something that I hate almost more than anything else, and that is to call the dentist. Now, I've shared with you before how I just loathe the dentist office. I just don't like it. I mean, I know some of you work in dentistry. Praise Christ for you. You're amazing. You do wonderful things. Uh, this is not a, this, the issues with me. It's not with you. I just don't like it. I just don't. My, it makes me make sweat in places I didn't know I could sweat. makes my blood pressure go up. I get super anxious and kind of shaky and jittery. Just don't like it. But I thought I, I better stare down the beast now. If there is an issue, then wait until it's much worse and I really can't stand it. So let's go ahead and Knock it out now. So I called, got an appointment, rolled up to the dentist's office. And after I, I threw up in my car from anxiety, I walk into the dentist's office, sit down in the chair and say, hey, I got, listen, before you do anything, listen, I know I've missed a couple of cleanings. Okay, I don't need you to judge me right now. I don't need that shame in my life. I haven't been here in a while. I got a toothache. Would you kind of look just to make sure there's nothing deeply wrong here. So I get in the chair and, and he whips out his toolbox full of, of who knows what. And he starts just scraping and, and prodding and, and knocking and mashing. And he's like, any of that hurt? I'm like, no, like apart from all the scraping and knocking and mashing you did, it didn't hurt at all. He said, okay, well, looks like whatever's going on here it, it isn't going to kind of be anything we can get just by knocking and doing our little our surface test. Then he said something that, that I thought just perfectly sets up where James has us going this morning. He said, hey, whatever is going on with your tooth, it, it's, not, it's not on the surface. The surface of the tooth is fine. Whatever, whatever's causing you pain, whatever's bothering you, is going to be something that's underneath the surface. It's not on top. It's deeper than that. And as soon as he said that, I thought that, that's exactly James's point in our passage this morning. Except he's not talking about toothaches. He's talking about conflict. He's, he's not talking about dental pain. He's talking about relational pain. And one of the things that I just love about the scriptures is they are just brutally honest about the human experience. They're just honest, man. And one of the things that they're honest about is the reality that, that there's going to be some conflict in, in our lives. Is there not? Like unless you were born on Mars where there are no people, or, or so they tell us, unless you're born on Mars, if you live long enough, you're going to get smacked with some conflict. And, and so why does that happen? Like, like, where does that come from? And what are we as Christians supposed to, to do about it? And, and that's where James is, is leading us in, in our conversation as we walk through, uh, continue our journey through the book of James this morning. So if you have a Bible, a James chapter 4 is where we're going to pick it up. James chapter 4. It should be a hardback maroon one on the, on the back of the seat in front of you if, you if you don't have one. The text is in the connection guide. Take some notes there if you want. James chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 1 and read through verse 12. James chapter 4. Actually, let's just read through verse 10. James 4. Pick it up in verse 1. What is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? You desire and don't have, so you murder. And covet and can't obtain, so you fight and wage war. You don't have because you don't ask. Verse 3. And even when you do ask... You don't receive because you ask with, with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. So as we read this, there's a word you, you need to be paying attention to. It's the word you. You're going to see that over and over and over again. You, 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 you. Verse 4. You, adulterous people, don't you know that friendship, intimacy, shaping your life, 
like the world, the pattern of the world around us is hostility toward God. So whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think it's without reason that the scripture says the spirit he made to dwell in us envies intensely? Love this next line. But he gives greater grace. Therefore, he says in Proverbs 3, quotes, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Father, help us. Give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. Give us hearts that long to be godly when it comes to relationships and conflict. We need you. Help us do some work in our hearts. In your name we ask all these things. Amen. So James, just, he just bluntly lays before us three realities about conflict that we've got to see this morning if we're going to walk in the kind of unity and wholeness and maturity, chapter 1, and harmony that Christ calls us to walk in, not just as individuals, but, but as believers, as a faith family, as people living as salt and light in the world around us. Here's the first reality. You got it in your connection guide. The root of conflict is disordered desires. Disordered desires. This is verse 1. Look at this. It says, what is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come, he asks, from your, this, this is a huge phrase, passions that wage war within you. So that, that's the root, and we've got to do a little bit of work on this phrase, passions that wage war within you. It is just jam-packed with meaning and nuance. I just want to point out a couple of things. Here's the first one. This phrase like literally means selfish pleasures, selfish desires, selfish ambitions, selfish lusts, selfish cravings, me, 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 me. That, that's the thrust of the word. And the picture he's painting is there's something that, that I want, something that I, I crave, something I think I'm owed, something I think I deserve, and you're not giving it to me. You stand in my way of that. So I just am going to start fuming and raging and becoming bitter and angry and jealous. And then all that is a perfect kind of cocktail for conflict to erupt. It's like putting a mint and Diet Coke. It just explodes the whole thing. So when I was a little kid, probably six or seven, I had this, um, this memory, it's one of my few memories of, of my childhood, actually. I was, I was standing in my room playing with my toy. I think it was a video game or something. And my older brother comes in my room, and he wants the toy. I think it was a video game. He wants the video game. Okay, but I, but I don't, I'm playing with it now. Okay, I, I don't, it's mine. I don't, I don't want you to have it. I think I'm owed it, not yours. But he thinks he's owed it, and he thinks it's not mine. So then we, it starts to get a little bit elevated. He's like six, seven years old. So, he, so he, he's much older than me, much bigger, stronger. So it starts to get elevated. And then what begins to happen is I think, this is mine. You better not touch it. I'm entitled to happiness here. And he thinks, no, 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 it's mine. Give it back to me. And, and all this is taking place in front of my dresser where I just happened to keep my cactus plant. I was a weird kid. A cactus plant that's about the size of a softball. And so at some point, we reach the point in the conflict where we're just raging at each other, mine, 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 me, 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 and rather than talk through it like normal humans, we get to a point where he's so angry that he picks up the cactus plant and implants it in my forehead. So I'm walking around, I go to my mom, I'm like, wah, wah, wah. Uh, Now, that's, a, that, that's goofy, silly, childish, ridiculous, and yet that is the picture of conflict that James is painting here. He's, saying, he's talking about conflict that has as its root a heart that operates as if I'm the center of the universe. Everything 
and everyone exists for me. Now, we'll never admit that because it's hard to admit it. It's impossible to admit it. But the kind of conflict he's talking about is, is a kind of conflict rooted in a heart that genuinely believes, or at least operates as if, everything and everyone in your life exists for you. To get you what you want, when you want it, how you want it. And, and so if you operate like that, James is saying, hey, there's going to be some issue. There's something going on here at the root of your heart. There, there's, some selfish, there's some selfish desires that maybe, just maybe, are at the root of your conflict. But there's a second thing that James is after here. So he says, listen, we did an x-ray of your conflicts. And what we found was there's some selfishness in your heart. So we threw up the x-ray of your conflicts recently, what's going on in your life. We found some selfishness in there. But he's not going to stop there. He's going to say, hey, listen, that's selfishness. That's just a symptom. That's not the disease. we got to get deeper than that. So it's not just on the surface of the tooth. It's toward the root. So we've got to go deeper than selfishness. And he points to the, the, the actual disease that once it flares up, plays itself out in selfishness. And that disease, what he says is at the root of all of our conflict, or at least most of it, is idolatry. Now, I don't know how much you know about the Old Testament, but the Old Testament is almost story after story after story of the people of God being lured into, sucked into idolatry. And if you read a good chunk of the Old Testament, it's just conflict and war and fighting and killing and judgment because of idolatry. Now, if you're new to church, new to the Bible, here's the simplest way I know how to explain idolatry. Disordered desires. Idolatry is disordered desires. When what shouldn't be uppermost in your affections becomes uppermost in your affections. When your affections get disordered so that the place the Lord rightly should be gets shifted and something has to take its place. And, and what James is saying here is the thing that's taking its place is you. So he's saying, yeah, yeah, selfish desires, but those are rooted in an idolatry, a, a wicked, idolatrous heart that says, listen, I know you created me. I know, God, that you, you designed me to, to be at my fullest and best when I'm submitting to you as king, when I submit to you as Lord. I know that my heart is full and my life sinks up best. I find my fullest possible joy when, when you're uppermost in my affections, not anything else. But I just don't like that. I, I just can't, I can't vibe with that. I, I just, that's not working for me. So, so I'm going to replace you, God, with, with me. I, I think I would rather be uppermost in my, I think I'm a better God than you are. I don't care what the Bible says. I think at the bottom, I would be happier if I worshipped me, not you. Now, I've never heard anybody say that out loud. But I've had hundreds of conversations with men and women whose lives are just embroiled in conflict who operate that way. As if somehow they're a better God than God is. As if somehow things work better when they worship the throne of themselves instead of King Jesus. And what happens is things get disordered, get disfigured, and it's a train wreck. And and the brunt of that train wreck most often plays itself out in relationships. So James says, listen, when, you're, when your desires get disordered and you exchange worship of the king of the universe with worship of you, and if we could just do a quick comparison, God is an amazing king. You're not. God is omniscient, omnipresent, worthy of all worship and praise, and, and you failed fifth grade. So we're different. We're just not the same. And when we slip into exchanging our, our affections and they get disordered, our desires get out of whack, what happens is conflict. Because that's the only thing that can happen. See, if everything else in your life exists to serve you, then you're looking around and people are not doing that. They do their own thing, it seems. So then you become the point, and man, when you're the point, you're just miserable. I, I'm the most miserable in my life when I get sucked into thinking 
that my wife, my kids, my co they, they all exist for me, to make me happy, do what I want, just get it done, don't ask questions, serve me, love me, comfort me, care for me. And, and when I slip into that mode, I'm just miserable because I, I'm not the point. Wasn't designed to be the point, can't be the point. And yet, when your desires get disordered, what begins to take root is idol worship. And the idol isn't something you put on your mantle. It's something deep inside your soul. The idol is you. And the people that experience the brunt, who are shredded by the shrapnel of your selfishness and idolatry, of my selfishness and idolatry, are first and foremost the people around us, right? So, yes, the root of conflict is, is disordered desires, but the result of disordered desires is fractured relationships. So that's how James picks up the conversation in, in verse 2. Let's read this, verses 2 and 3. Hey, your passions wage war within you, and look what happens. You desire, and yet you don't have, so you murder. Not, that's not literal murder. He's talking about you're, you reach a point where you're willing to kill the relationship because of your own idolatry. You murder, and, and you covet, but you can't obtain, so you fight and wage war. You don't have, you don't ask, and even when you do ask, you ask to spend it on your pleasures. Same word in verse 1. Passions, pleasures, selfish desires. So here's what he's saying. You want what other people have. You think you're owed it. You think somehow they've, they've gotten the leg up on you, and it's not fair, it's not right, it's not just. And you want so badly what they have. Where they, I mean, just scroll social media, and you'll find yourself slipping into this. I want that. They're better than me, greater than me. I deserve that. How are they getting that when I work twice as hard? You just go into a toxic kind of rabbit trail, and you want it, crave it, lust after it, to the point that you're willing to sever your relationship with them. And you initiate childish, silly conflict. We wage war, launch an all-out assault. So this language of wage war, you fight, you murder. That, I don't know about you, that, that's not language I use when I describe healthy, vibrant, full relationships. Like if you ask me, hey, how, how is your relationship with your kids going? I say, man, it's going great. We fight and murder and wage war all the time. It's amazing. That, that's not happy, full, vibrant language. That is provocative, violent, graphic language where James says, hey, when you slip into worshiping yourself, you put yourself on the throne of your heart. And God help us, we live in a culture that would have you believe that that's where you belong. Then the only logical outcome is that you're going to begin to fracture relationships all around you. Work, wife, spouse, kids, grandkids, parents, grandparents, co-workers, blah, you name it. Because you bought the lie that you're the point. You've let your affection slip into worshiping you more than the king of the universe. And what James says happens here is a lot of murder and fighting and war waging. It has at its root disordered desires where we love ourselves more than we love the Lord. And that's actually what James says here is all those fractured relationships that you're walking in are actually just symptomatic of and downstream from the fundamentally fractured relationship, which isn't with other people, it's with, with God. That's where he goes next in verse 4. He says, you adulterous people. Don't you know that, that friendship with the world, flirting with the world is hostility toward God? So, man, if you want to be a friend of the world, then you're just going to be an enemy of God. Don't you know that, that it's for a purpose that the, the Scriptures say the Spirit he, met, he made to dwell in us envies intensely. So James just keeps snatching from Old Testament texts like Isaiah, and Jeremiah, and Hosea, and he's painting this picture of idolatry, in this case, worship of self, as a kind of spiritual adultery. The picture is of a, a wife actively, willingly, knowingly cheating on her husband. So just, just imagine like 
How insane would it be if at some point this week, around the dinner table, my wife said, hey, babe, listen, I, I know we just celebrated 10 years together. I know we got three kids. We got a lot of memories. We're best friends. We're synced up right now in a sweet, good season. J- just wanted you to, to know that I'm going to go on a date tomorrow night with my coworker. I mean, it's probably nothing. It's probably going nowhere. I, I probably don't even like this guy. He's probably just creepy and weird, but, but just want to kind of try just one day, one small little thing, not going to go anywhere. So if you could just watch the kids later this week while I go out on a date with my coworker, that would be great. Now, how insane, like how unloving, how broken would it sound if I said, are you serious? Oh my gosh, babe, that's amazing. Like I've been hoping you'd find a man who would satisfy you and keep you and, and, and love your kids and feed you and put a house around you, take care of you, protect you. I was praying that for you. That's amazing. I hope it goes spectacular. Now I can promise you I won't respond that way. I'll be, I'll be disoriented. I'll be brokenhearted. I'll be blind with rage at some moron who wants to steal my wife, who wants to woo her affections. I'm jealous for her. That's James's point in verse 5. See, you exchange love of God Almighty with love of puny little you. Yeah, you start fracturing all your relationships with people around you, but ultimately you fracture your relationship with the Lord, who, verse 5, is jealous for you. He's jealous for your affections, for your obedience, for your submission, for you finding your hope and peace and life and joy in him where it can only be found. And I know some of you have testimonies where you've, you've been there, done that, didn't work. So it's not just fracturing relationships horizontally, those are actually, James is saying, an outworking of a fundamentally fractured relationship with with the Lord. He calls it spiritual adultery. It's this weighty emotional response that James wants us to feel when our hearts get disoriented, our affections get, get shifted, our desires are disordered, and we place ourselves on the throne of our heart where only the Lord belongs, and we replace our affections for him with ourselves. And, and my guess is, if we could just sit down and have honest conversation, and you were to tell me about seasons of conflict in your life, if we dug around deep enough, we would get to a point where, where you would say, yeah, that, that was my story. I, I started believing that everything, everyone existed for me to make me happy, satisfy my needs, want, do what I want. When I, and James is saying, listen, you're sick. There's, there's a disease you, you've, you've disordered your desires. It's fracturing your relationship. So, okay, where do we go from here? Like, what do we do? H- how do we take next steps? And thankfully, that's where James takes us next as we wrap it up this morning. He says, let me just read to you verse 6. He paints this picture of, of a wife cheating on her husband and says, hey, that's what happens when you exchange love for me with love for self. And it's no wonder that it goes bad for you in your relationships because it can't go any, any other way than that. But then he says this in verse 6. Though we wander and are unfaithful and worship ourselves far more than we'd like to admit. Verse 6, God gives greater grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's the gospel. That is, despite our selfishness, despite our idolatry, despite our shortcomings, despite our exchanging love for the Lord with love for ourselves, despite it going horribly wrong for us, he doesn't say, we need to take a break from one another. He doesn't say, let's get separate, let, let, let's get divorced. He says, no, I'm, I'm going to draw near. I'm going to come close. I'm going to give grace. So what's the remedy for fractured relationships? You got it in verse 6. God resists the proud, but what? Gives grace to the humble. So the root of our conflict is disordered desires. And, and the result of those Disordered desires is fractured relationships. But hear this, church. The remedy 
for fractured relationships is grace given humility. Did you see that? God gives grace to the humble. Now, why is it grace driven? Well, here's why. Because the default mode, the default posture of our heart is to love, adore, and worship ourselves. Is it not? Like, that's why Jesus says, hey, love your neighbor as who? As you love yourself. Because you love yourself a whole lot. And if you can just leverage some of that love for you into your love for other people, you might actually start living like I live and acting like I, I act. So the default posture, the default mode of the human heart is to love, adore, and worship self. To put ourselves on the throne and, and say, forget God, I don't need you, God. You make a crummy God anyway. And listen, we don't have to be taught that. We just show up that way. Like we got three kids at home and we've never set them down and said, listen, boo, when, when you're playing with Polly Pocket and your sister comes in and takes Polly Pocket from you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to first scream as loud as you can. And then I want you to take your fist and I want you to ball it up as tight as you can. And get a wide base and start from the hips. And I want you to punch your sister as hard as you can. We never taught them that. But we're managing that kind of conflict all the time in our house. So they just show up that way. 2 Timothy 3, the default mode of the human heart is to be lovers of self. So it's going to take a supernatural work of, God's, of the Holy Spirit by the grace of God to do a root canal on your soul and gut out the idol of selfishness and pack it in with humility. That happens by grace. And the funny thing is, if you think, you know, I'm, I'm disciplined enough to do it myself, you just going to become prideful, arrogant, and self-righteous. So it's, it takes some grace. It's grace given. But what about humility? What does that mean? What, what, is, what is this word that is so packed, pregnant with meaning here? Paul gives us a glimpse of it in Philippians 2. You have it on the screen. Philippians 2, Paul says, hey, what is humility? One answer Paul gives is, we can kind of tease it out from Philippians 2, 3. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in what? In humility. Okay, here's a clue. Consider others. That's more important than yourselves. Okay. Anybody else just hate that that verse is in there? I just love myself. And I love me. And I want to be uppermost, central. I want to be the point. Love that. And, and Paul's saying, no, no, no. You want to walk in humility? It's going to take grace, but it's going to look like you considering others is more important than yourself. So humility is just simply having an appropriate understanding of who we are in light of who God is. It's us acknowledging that we aren't the center of the universe. God is. It's us acknowledging that everything and everyone exists to make much of him, not make much of us. Which frees us up, hear this, frees us up to acknowledge that we're not the point, he is. Which then frees us up to say, hey, listen, I want to meet your needs. I want to meet your desires. I want to, I want to encourage you and build you up and make, make you the point. Now, that's a, that's a radically different way to live than our culture, is it not? I mean, we, we are sold day in and day out. You're the point, you matter, you deserve this, you're owed this, you're entitled to this. And, and, and Paul's saying, hey, no, that's not humility. That's not by grace. That's demonic, James says in, earlier in chapter 3. Grace given humility. Now, what does that kind of humility look like? So that's kind of a definition, but, but how do we live it out? And, and thankfully, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. James actually answers that question. Let me read this in verses 7 through 10. God gives grace to the humble. Therefore, therefore, so, so pay attention, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will... Flee from you. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Verse 8. Cleanse your hands, sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. So, so four ways, really quick. How do we drink the balm, the healing balm of humility. That's the remedy. How do, we, how do we do it? First, we submit to God. If you want to walk in humility, 
if we've got any shot at walking in grace given humility, we're going to have to get off the throne of our own hearts and gladly submit to the lordship of Jesus. So you're gonna, with, with all the grace he'll give you, you're going to have to just acknowledge that you, you just make a terrible God. You just make a crummy Lord and Savior. You might be amazing at business, might be loved by a lot of people, be the most amazing grandparent on planet Earth. You just make a terrible God. And, and that's really good news. Because the universe isn't designed to revolve around you or me. It's designed to revolve around God. And so the first step toward walking in humility is acknowledging, listen, when I operate as if I'm the center of the universe, my life is a train wreck. But when my desires get in order, when, when you're uppermost in my affections, now I've got a, a, a shot at walking in humility. So submit to God. Second, resist the devil. This is verse 7. Submit to God, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Here, here's what James is trying to tell us. And, and I think our experience as Christians, whether you've been a Christian for five minutes or 50 years, will bear this out. We have, despite what our culture would have us believe, we have a legitimate enemy. Are you hearing me? We have a legitimate enemy, a ferocious adversary. His name is Satan. And he hates you. You gotta, you gotta know that, that you got an enemy that hates you. But man, he loves conflict. I think the enemy loves when the divorce rate among Christian homes gets higher and higher and higher and higher to the point that it surpasses the divorce rate of non believing couples. The adversary loves that. He loves when you get on Facebook and lay into somebody and start some explosive conflict about nothing. And then the very first thing on your profile is saved by grace, follower of Jesus. Get out of here with that. Satan loves that. He loves when we're constantly fighting about just goofy, silly stuff in the church. He loves when your life is constantly inflamed with silly, petty, nagging conflict about nothing. And and we call ourselves Christian. He He just loves that. So you got to know, listen, we got an enemy, and he hates you, he hates me, he hates our church. He hates your marriage, hates your kids, hates your family, hates your job, hates everything about you that's wholesome, godly, and full of life and vitality. So we got to know it. we got to be humble enough to say, hey, listen, we are all too often a sitting duck for the adversary. We go seasons without reading our Bible. We struggle to pray. We don't walk in discipleship. All that stuff is a toxic mix for being a sitting duck for the enemy. And then we got to say, listen, I'm clinging to the promise of 1 Corinthians 10, 13. That yes, we have an enemy, but God has grace and power and strength for us to resist. That, that word is a military term. means stand firm, hold the line, be ruthless. Don't give an inch. And I'll give you grace and power to resist. And when you do, what's the promise? He'll flee. Submit to God, resist the devil. Third is pursue the Lord. Third, third recipe for walking in humility is pursue the Lord. It's funny, those two things go together, don't they? It's hard to pursue the adversary and pursue the Lord. You resist, that, that's an offensive posture. Then we're also going to pursue the Lord. Get in grace given humility. We go, yeah, I know we have an enemy. He's far more cunning and insidious and smart, and deceptive. Just ask Adam and Eve back in Genesis 3. But we also have a need for a steady, intentional, regular diet of the word, of prayer, of community, of discipleship, of accountability. That's that's the God-given means by which we pursue the Lord. Here's what happens. I can promise you this in my own life. When I start drifting, when, my, when the flame of my affections for the Lord starts to burn out, what takes its place? Worship of me. I, I just love me. I am most selfish and prideful and arrogant when I am not walking with the Lord. So it's no wonder that if we don't pursue the Lord in grace given humility, our life is a train wreck, full of conflict and bitterness and anger. And, so pursue. The Lord, regular diet of word, prayer, community, discipleship, and lastly is this. So, so we submit to God, 
we resist the devil, we pursue the Lord, and then we're serious about sin. This is what all this talk about is in, in verses 8 and 9. Cleanse your hands, purify your hearts, be miserable, mourn, weep, stop laughing at your sin, let your joy be turned to gloom. Here, here's the picture James is painting. Humility is serious about sin. Humility keeps a constant check on your heart, on your desires. Humility is constantly looking at the life 360 of your heart, of your desires, of your affections. And as soon as it spots roots of pride and selfishness start to creep down into your soul, it's quick to confess, repent, squash it. So if we we got any shot of walking in humility, submit to the Lord, Resist the devil, pursue God, and, and get serious about your sin. Now, here's how I want to close. We've already seen that the root of, con- of conflict is, is disorder desires. And when that happens, it starts to fracture relationships with other people and ultimately with the Lord. And the remedy, the balm, the prescription is grace-given humility. And so I just got to wonder this morning, oh, where... Where are you? Like if, if we did an x-ray of your heart, what, what would it reveal? Would it reveal any kind of seriousness about your own sin? Or, or would it be a heart that just kind of loves to, to watch garbage Netflix shows and Crass joking, gossiping, slander. And James is saying, listen, pay attention to the x-ray. It's no wonder that your life is embattled with conflict when you're not serious about your sin. He'd even say this. Here's how I think he would start the conversation based on this text. He'd say, listen, we did an x-ray of your heart. It's, we put it up here on the screen. Here's some questions I've got to ask you as, as your doctor. Do you find yourself constantly in conflict? I mean, I have people in my life who, whenever I hear from them, it's because some conflict has erupted in their life. And here, here's, what I, here's the pattern that I start to notice in my own self and other people. If you're constantly in conflict with spouse, kids, boss, friends, church, whatever, James would say, listen, pay attention. Be careful. It sounds like you've got a pride issue. It, it sounds like your heart might be sick with selfishness, and it's fracturing all your relationships. And your next step this morning is to own your pride, repent, confess it, and then cling to the good news of the gospel. Because of the cross of Jesus Christ, he he draws near to us when we draw near to him in the middle of, despite our infectious, diseased, Heart that's full of pride, he he draws near and gives grace if we'll confess, own, repent. Hey, what about this? Have you given Satan a foothold in your heart that is sparking conflict in your at your house, at, at your job, with your family, with your friends, in your dorm room, at your how do I know? Well, do you have a regular diet of the word, of prayer? of community, of discipleship? Are, are you pursuing the Lord at all? Is any of that evident in your life? Here, here's the last question I'd ask you. It, is there a relationship that you need to mend today? Like, like even in a room this size, here's what I'm guessing. Some of you are in the middle of a lingering conflict that's been going on for months, years, decades, or maybe even you, just, you had a conflict as you got out of the car this morning. Whether it's lingering or it's fresh, you said some things out of your own selfishness that wounded, scarred, fractured. And at some point this morning, the Holy Spirit just gently nudged you and said, hey, that was selfish. That was prideful. That was, that was all about you. 
And, and so your next step this morning is to own it, apologize, ask forgiveness. Well, it's it's going to be hard, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> It'll be hard. But God gives grace to the humble. Is there a relationship you need to mend this morning? Is there a conflict you're in that's ungodly and wicked and selfish and could just with two sentences disintegrate if you would initiate humility? I love this quote from Spurgeon. We'll wrap it up here. He said this, Every Christian has a choice between being humble or being humbled. Every Christian has a choice, being humble or being humbled. What's your choice this morning? Will you continue to drink the poison of pride that will slowly kill you? Or will you accept the remedy of grace given humility that leads us into the path of life and joy and maturity? What's, what's your choice? Let's pray. This morning, Father, thank you. This is a heavy text. So many of us just despise conflict, and that's part of that's good and right. And we don't ask for legitimate wrongs to be looked over. We don't ask for legitimate harms to be glossed over. We just ask for wisdom and strength, courage and grace to walk in humility that that discerns when a conflict has reached a point where it's ungodly, unhelpful, fracturing, and destructive. And so I, I pray right now, as I prayed all week for marriages that are tense, that are just rife with conflict, that's rooted in idolatry, that's rooted in selfishness, I pray that you would clip out of our hearts the pride and selfishness that so easily entangles and nestles deep within us. I pray for relationships that are fractured, that are broken, conflicts that have lingered for months, years, decades. I pray that today would be the day where by your grace, by your spirit, you would give us courage and humility to initiate the conversation, own where we've been wrong, own where we walked in pride, ask forgiveness and cling to the good news of the gospel that it's at our worst, in the middle of our deepest pride, that you draw near, you forgive, you give grace, you strengthen, you encourage. I pray for those this morning who are are not believers and they just have no recourse for how to handle conflict in a godly way because they're in conflict with you, eternal conflict because of their sin, I pray that you would open their hearts, open their minds, bring them to a place where they, in grace, given humility, confess that they need you, that they're broken without you, that they stand guilty before you, and that you've made a way through your life, death, and resurrection for them to draw near to you as you draw near to them. We thank you that you love us. Thank you for hard texts like this. We pray that we would be a people and a church marked by humility, grace, and mercy, and unity, all the more as we see the day approaching. We love you. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen. 